My name is Jamie Warburton, and uh, I will not torture you terribly much, in theory. This is the title poem from my collection, Note That They Cannot Live Happily, and it's written in three voices, and there's an epigraph, because poems love epigraphs. Um, it's from the Goose Girl, the Brothers Grimm version. When the hour for departure drew near, the old mother went to her bedroom, and taking a small knife, she cut her fingers till they bled. Then she held a white rag under them, and letting three drops of blood fall into it, she gave it to her daughter, and said, Dear child, take great care of this rag. It may be of use to you on the journey. One. Leave me for a husband, daughter, my flesh doll. I picture you waiting by a new window, but take me with you against your breast, hidden. You'll still see me, leaning down to drink. I am duck bones boiled in milk, the scent of roast meat on the wind, the sound of knives through celery. Two. Dear mother, today your blood floated down the river. A pity the handkerchief was soft. Still en route to castle, weather fine and warm. Three. Straight ahead, philosophy texts in my saddlebags may disagree, but I say it's the best way. With blinders, to my left could be anything. Apple trees, sorcerers, home. Sun up, walk. Sun high, walk. Sun down, kneel down. Nothing changes, but everything might. I could find myself on a bluff. I could kick loose stones. I could lose this load. But carrying's just carrying. We stop. I listen. We start. Someone runs off behind me. Moccasins, scuffing. A bride gone? It doesn't matter. Not to me. Who could tell from shifting weight? Princess? Ladies' maid? That's the end of that one. Um, when I was in grad school, my first semester, I decided to try to title my um, poems for my first semester of workshop, My Mother and Other Women. And my professor told me I should expand my subject matter, which I have yet to do. <laughs> this one's called On a Distinct Treasure Within the Museum. One, 4,000 feet below sea level, there is no light. Before 2004, no one had seen even footage of a live giant squid. Sometimes they washed up, dead but not eaten. Without the benefit of circulation, their arrowhead-shaped bodies have begun to disintegrate like chicken fat in hot water. Other times, sperm whales have been discovered with bits of undigested squid in their stomachs. The female squids can be over 16 feet long, longer than my mother plus my mother plus my mother. This is why we use the word giant. At the top, their tentacles are as thick as my ribs, but sperm whales, desperate for water's relief from gravity at 72 tons, are nearly all mouth. They have been found, perhaps 50 years old, perhaps older, scarred by tooth-lined suckers. I am amazed by the thrashing the two animals must make, locked together too far below the surface to splash. The eyes of the squid are like the eyes of God. What I mean to say is they are unbelievably large eyes. Two, mating habits of the anglerfish. The male anglerfish, white and tiny, swims until he finds a female, then bites her, sucking onto a side or the back of her head. As she continues through the water, he begins to atrophy. First, the muscles in his mouth disintegrate, fuse. His brain slows and intestines slacken. Eventually, he's nothing but a stunted sack of sperm, a slight deformity useful should she need to reproduce. It is not unusual to find a female with three or more male bodies embedded in her flesh, whereupon she resembles a chimera, the scaly bulges obtrusive but not impeding her swim. He laughed when I called him over, and he joked, Am I a parasite? I looked back at him and said, I don't like metaphors. <laughs> Three, away from the Nile we've been dying for years. After death, the body first stiffens and then falls slack. The soft parts will disintegrate, or, if they are ambitious enough, turn to leather and join the bones in stubborn refusal to disappear. This, of course, is only in conjunction with dry heat or ice, natural or forced. 
The Egyptians took control and urns and salt, hooked the brains out through the nose and pickled the liver. The dead were sent out with wrappings, cats, and slaves, which was a good deal for everyone but the cats and the slaves. If I could choose, I'd be like this body. Post generations of sand blown on and blown off, quiver full beside my thighs the size of ankle bones, skin tight ribs, a seamless arch for moats, and tongue locked firm behind granite teeth. Another thing about poetry is that sometimes everybody's miserable in it, but I tend to think that's hilarious in a way. Uh, so if you think something's funny, you're probably right and you're allowed to laugh. It's okay. This one is called, This is the World We Wanted. This child is flesh of your flesh alone. There is nothing to temper the dance in her blood, nothing of my sharpness or sixth grade algebra, just your gestures deep in her grand foot stamping. I become a witchy watcher, sans oven, can't molar her enough, a truffle, white. Rain has made her and musk, and a log in the backwoods, a house less gingerbread than cobweb, cracked timber. Suspicious stranger's eye, my brown hands drop to tug her hair, strands tangled over Anne of Green Gables' forehead. With that brow, yes, she is the most toothsome of shade-soaked morsels, toadstool fingers, a veal fed on mother's milk, and dandelion fluff. She sows weeds purposefully. She cuts her own hair. The arms, circumference of my wrist bones, have no bones. How could a creature be built on a skeleton at all? How could she have come from you, love, as anything but an ununderstandable piece of sugary rennet? This one is called My Favorite Part is the Point. Bad hosts we may be, Yet death always remembers us, shows up with a bottle. <laughs> this poem um, is a prose poem, and it takes its inspiration from the pantoum, which is a poetic form that's a lot harder than a prose poem, and I didn't actually write one. Um, but in the pantoum, every line is repeated twice. And this is called the pantoum says everything twice. The pantoum is my therapist. Doctor, pantoum, heir, pantoum, heiress. How do you feel about that? Pause. How do you feel about that? I sit on the pantoum's couch. In my mind, I'm watching a woman with gray hair, red bandana, and dream catcher earrings eat a sub sandwich at a bus stop. I haven't eaten a sandwich in over a year. Maybe that will save me from becoming her. Your mother? About, about your mother? Becoming her is an entirely different matter. It's her hands now, already, on my lap, knuckle-bumping, vein-knobbing. When did that happen? Do you remember? Remember. You do? I do. I did. I did until I didn't, but I always do. My mother in the bathtub. My mother in the hallway, ghosting over the vacuum. My mother in the kitchen, swinging between the counter and island with ex-gymnast arms. You should get a samovar in here, says the bus stop woman in my head. Half a sub left, a little oil at the corner of her mouth. I could teach you how to make Russian tea. My mother and her kettle with internal thermometer. My own internal thermometer. I've lost it. Who can take my temperature? Where is my fever now? What are you thinking? Asks the pantoum. Are you thinking? What? Some of you are so kind. <laughs> this one is called The Same Sad as Me. I'll finish the wine in your glass. Lick the maple-crusted pan. Just tell me what you wore at your wedding. Prance with me like meerkats. Isn't the sky a confusing feeling tonight? Half storm and half something else? What do you feel like under it? I feel like. I feel like. This is my favorite cheese. This is my favorite cat. This is my favorite pair of socks. Did you play that game with your mother when she hides behind the bed until you swear you're home alone, then she jumps out and yells, I'm not your mother? <laughs> 
in the toy store, can you find the glowing sheep, the spinning bats, the geodes, dusty and uncracked, the jaguar crouch, jaguar pounce, flip books half under discount cards, the silks? When your husband comes home, does he find you at your desk, all cigarettes and crumpled starts? Do you look up? Do you say, let's watch the Three Stooges. I need to see a banana peel and a two by four before bed. <laughs> Here's a poem with another epigraph. I know, poets. Um, the poem is called Evolution, Propagation, and Defense. And the epigraph is by Virginia Woolf. Put another rung on the ladder and let me climb up. In the slow mornings, while her son sleeps down the hall and I don't have to work for three weeks yet, in those summer six o'clocks, I rediscover opening, rediscover what I want more. And those limbs, rounded muscles, thighs clasping, feet forming, air pockets between their soles, hair curling back from brow, nothing but forearm holding either up. In this, we are like everyone else. What difference could I claim? under this one sun, and my counting a lover's breaths, wondering at the texture of skin beneath reading fingertips. There is flesh, yes, to press between tendons, curve and waist and breast and breastbone to find. How can I demand any special worth for the pulling of our own blood, this wild desire for story, to have been there, meditation on the lover's perfect strangeness, on each moat that is unarguably other. Oh, to say no one can come in here. This moment is mine to trust, the new tide to decide. As long as you wake me with a stack of books in that mouth, I will stay, I will stay, I will always stay. This is not too strange. This is not something we have invented, yet is no less rare for that. Does each single cell not struggle for division, flounder in most basic soup? Another short one. I really like words. I used to, to work for <coughs> wordsmith writing um, dictionary and thesaurus and glossary kind of definitions, and I could have, whew, Talk about words forever. Uh, and there's a fun word in this title, ephemeral. This is what they call ephemeral. The flick of a low lighter inhaled. The breath of the last year your father lit your July 4th sparklers. The wet split of buried bulb, newborn every year. The nursing home resident watching herself dance on Super 8. And this kiss trying to bring you back, a stillborn kitten in a warm white oven. My students always are reading things off their screens, and I'm like, oh, how can you do that? But then I throw my papers everywhere, and I'm sure they're wondering the same thing about me. Um, there's a, a poem by Dorothy Parker, Resume. Any of you know that one? Well, it used to be recited to me when I was a child. I'm going to read it for you now. Razors pain you, rivers are damp. Acids stain you, and drugs cause cramp. Guns aren't lawful, nooses give, gas smells awful, you might as well live. <laughs> and we wonder. <laughs> and this poem is called, You Might As Well. I went off to die like a cat to the woods. I walked back. I tied my tie like a hangman's noose. I fell down. I kicked a hole in the wall and I planned a great leap. I went to bed. I went to bed and went to bed and went to bed. I swallowed until I puked. I cut until I bled. I kept on bleeding. I printed a permit and got too tired. I stalked through the camo, a curious figure. I drove cars too fast but still licked every curve. I cried for the oven's clean gas and blamed blonde path, plath and old England. I got up, I got up, you were there with plates of food, and I fed the cat, and I drank the coffee, and I smoked and smoked and smoked, you were there, and I got back in bed, and I got out of bed, and I screamed on the floor, you were there, I was there, with you there, I came home, I came back. Mm. 
Once I was seven days sober. Once I was seven days sober and thinking the world must be God's one-week chip, tossed into his change tray, half buried in spare buttons, thread clumps and safety pins, the twinges of regret and self-abasement shocking him, small socket sparks when he touches it accidentally, when searching for something to slit open a bill or letter from an ex. He'll never bring himself to throw it away even since he's long returned to snuffed out nights, blessed relief, the alarm clock countdown to flick and bottle cap snick. Still, he earned it with those six acid nights of bile and labor. A couple more. It's called The Summer Between Two Years. We sat on the Yonkers balcony overlooking a neighbor's fenced yard and stone hem shrine to the Virgin Mary, smoke shared camels, after practice plies, one and two, hands on kitchen counter, the loose hip duck walk of used to be dancer carried you through the halls with mugs of tea and an occasional prat fall, faux mustache mimed elevator ride, time to catch the other unaware, Lucy to Ethel, Laurel to Hardy, Gracie to George, and Costello to Hey Abbott. Yeah, we sat on that balcony, metal gridded base, leaving SM fishnet impressions in our calves. And from an invisible nest somewhere above, near fetal birds kept falling, one every day or so, their translucent skin featherless windows to the small hot mass of just pulsing organs, blue and purple, and what had faded from red tiny puckers in their skin suits like pores on my arms, no neck, so slender, so nearly viable that there was nothing to do but lift the bodies one by one over the cat's curious head and scoop them, paper towel bound, into the trash. The mirror spoke. One more fairy tale epigraph from Snow White. The mirror spoke. Then she was satisfied, for she knew the mirror spoke the truth. Snow White is told by the Brothers Grimm. Listen, I watched you watch yourself. I saved your eyes in glass. I convinced myself they were mine. I drifted dartingly, then lingered on your pointed toes, firm legs. I searched for pale of shoulder, secret of spine, patience. I latticed a pie crust of years. I put by cherries, jars in my hoping chest. I hammocked restless in your mouth. I synchronized steps and watches. I hoped you might catch up. You approached me, maybe. You brought your body to me. I whispered spell after spell. You did not believe in fairy tales, but always in astrology. I'll show you yourself. You turn face. You roll your shoulders and coil your side. You dread and grimace and puff, but look in. Here is your little girl, Alice. I'll count kittens by willow roots. I'll tease and pull you down, call you fairest, though you laugh in our face. Fine, I'll be abbess, you my confessor. Here, I am your horoscope. Here, since you believe in fate, let me write out yours. Here, if I hang myself on your wall, will you step inside the glass? And I'll leave you with this last one, sleep training for adults. The noise machine plays the Metro North, arriving at the Yonkers station. There's men greeting their newspapers and women their coffees. Then the sound of side street traffic, not too much, on the way home from the zoo, as you and your mother walk, her carrying the empty lunch bag, your finger curled into her belt loop. Also, the beeping of machines, nurses' footsteps, a twilight where your father is never quite here or gone. Don't forget the oboe tuning up an orchestra, the collective inhalation of the woodwinds on the upbeat. Then there's your lover breathing deep, the sound of your never-born child stirring, thin milky wails. And the setting I click to, where over and over the priest says, I absolve you. Thank you.
My name is Eleanor Henderson. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you all for being here. I'm really happy also to be reading with Jamie and Rebecca tonight. Um, those are some of my favorite poems ever. Um, and I'm also a big fan of Rebecca's first book, Later at the Bar. I know everyone's very excited about her new book, but um, I used to teach her short story collection even before I moved to Ithaca. So um, very cool to finally be um, spending some time with you tonight. So I have read from this novel, 10,000 Saints, um, a number of times in this bookstore. I'm trying to milk it as long as I possibly can. <laughs> Um, I'm working on a new book, but it's super depressing. You don't want to hear it on a really pretty spring day. So I'm going to read a couple of short scenes from this book. So I need to tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's a novel set in 1988 in New York City and Vermont, and it opens um, on this sort of terrible night where um, our main character, Jude Keffy Horn, um, his best friend, Teddy, dies of a drug overdose. So um, I'm not really revealing anything that's not revealed on the back cover. So um, that happens early in the book. And then um, I'm going to be picking up a couple of, uh, a point of view in a couple of different places. The point of view that I'm going to be reading from is Jude's mother. So Jude is a 16-year-old boy who is, um, has just had this uh, sort of accident where he uh, was uh, also doing drugs with his friend and has spent the night in the snow and he has hypothermia. So the first scene that I'm going to read takes place from his mother Harriet's point of view. Um, she's this sort of um, not quite ex-hippie who is um, a, also a glass blower and um, hasn't entirely gotten the mother thing figured out yet. And she um, has found uh, Jude and Teddy um, in her, the, her al the alley behind her uh, apartment building the night before. And um, I guess this is a couple of, of mornings later. On the third morning in the hospital, the young doctor who had overseen Jude's MRI, the one who wore a ballpoint pen speared through her elaborate French twist, led Harriet into her office. When she drew a folder from a stack on her cluttered desk, Harriet knew what was coming, the bill. She had signed three or four consent forms already, on clipboards balanced on her knee beside Jude's bed, but no one had mentioned money, and she hadn't mentioned that she didn't have any. Before the divorce and for brief periods afterward, she had invested in family health care plans of the discount variety, but her children were rarely sick. It was cheaper to pay for Jude's Ritalin out of pocket than to cover the monthly premiums. For the big things, like the children's braces, she called less. She would, of course, have to call him again. She had called him the day it happened. Strangely, he already knew the story. His girlfriend's daughter and Teddy's poor brother, who had somehow become associated, had just burst through the door with the news. But she'd been too panicked at that point to discuss finances with her ex-husband, or for that matter, to talk to the daughter, whom she'd hoped could fill in the details of the previous evening. The detective assigned to Teddy's case soon took care of that, questioning the girl and Teddy's brother and Jude's friends, Jude, when the oxygen mask had been removed, volunteered that the huffing, both times, had been his idea, and that the marijuana had been Teddy's brother's. How easily it could have been her own. But nobody seemed to know anything about how the boy had gotten his hands on cocaine in Lindenburg. In the end, Harriet wasn't certain it mattered. Thankfully, the police officer was discreet and kind. He did not wish to badger a boy in a hospital bed. No foul play had taken place, just an accumulation of poor choices. Mrs. Horn, began the doctor, extracting the pen from her hair. Ms. I'm divorced. In fact, I never took my husband's name. Always just Ms. Horn. Ms. Horn. I hope you have some more papers for me to sign, Harriet said lightly, putting on her glasses. The doctor produced an exasperated smile. Actually, I was just reviewing your son's records. Tell me, this might come as a shock, but has he ever been assessed for fetal alcohol effects? Harriet, who had been sitting, she realized, in a rather unladylike position, knees apart, back slumped, pocketbook in her lap, wearing the same sack of a dress she wore yesterday, now sat up straight. She removed her glasses, let them bob on their chain. A trivial amount of alcohol had been found in Jude's system, but it was the Freon that had caused him to pass out, and he was okay now, scheduled to go home that afternoon. She said, Jude's 16. Yes, I know. Most children are diagnosed at a younger age, but not always, and I see that he's adopted. Was he tested for birth defects as an infant? 
I don't know. I don't think so. Is anything known about the pregnancy? Harriet shook her head. The doctor scribbled. She knew almost nothing about Jude's biological parents. That was the way most New York State adoptions had worked then. And he's on methylphenidate. Kids with FAE or FAS are often diagnosed with ADHD, often have trouble in school, even trouble with the law, which is why it's so important to take precautionary measures. Now, the hyperactivity and dyslexia combined with the adoption and the telling of facial features leads me to suspect, hold on, facial features? You have to spell things out. FAE, fetal alcohol effects, which includes fetal alcohol syndrome. The doctor, who appeared to be all of 21 years old, went on to describe Jude's cranial symptoms with a precision as though she, not Harriet, had kissed the boy goodnight every day for the last 16 years, that pierced Harriet's very brittle sense of reality. She felt dazed, dizzy, listening to the list that reduced her son's face to a series of tribal malformations. Short, upturned nose, flat space between nose and mouth, thin upper lip, small chin, short eye openings. His eye openings are just fine. They're perfect. Perhaps it's a mild case, the doctor said, not unkindly. Harriet said nothing. She was suddenly exhausted. She had slept about ten minutes in two days. Think about it a while. When Judas had time to recuperate, bring him in. He would just need to undergo a few tests, motor functions, language skills. The doctor recommended a birth defect specialist whose name Harriet promptly forgot. A firm diagnosis could be helpful to you. You could consider other medications. It could help answer questions about the source of your son's behavior. The source, said Harriet dreamily. She looked down into the gaping pocketbook on her lap. In it was the detritus of her slipshod motherhood. Keys, Kleenex, aspirin, cigarettes, checks decorated with a Grateful Dead dancing bears, a Snickers wrapper, an old shopping list, and a dime bag inside an Altoids tin inside a glove, which she decided then and there to flush the next time she had the chance. She closed her eyes. She could fall asleep right here, disappear. How wonderful it would be to find the source of all this, to blame it on some other mother. So that is uh, a scene fairly early in the book. Um, and then a lot of things happen over the course of the book. A lot of the book takes place from Jude's point of view and the point of view of these two other uh, characters with whom he becomes um, involved. Uh, a, w a girl named Eliza, who is mentioned in that scene, she's his father's girlfriend's daughter. And she has come to Vermont and right before that first scene and spent this very special and traumatic night. <coughs> with him and his friend Teddy. So she'll appear in the scene. Um, she comes back to uh, live with Jude and uh, Jude's mother back in Vermont later in the book, um, and she's pregnant, pregnant at 16. So um, that is the scene that we'll pick up in the sort of companion scene to that opening one. This is um, after, uh, after Eliza comes to live with them. This is what Harriet knew about the girl who had given birth to her son. She was Caucasian, and in 1971, she was unmarried, and she was 16. With these stark facts, Harriet had sculpted a number of identities over the years, characters who would visit but not quite haunt her dreams. Most often, she appeared as a flower child, a freckled village nymph with miles of long red hair. She was a girl who liked boys and dusty Springfield and getting stoned, and one night had had too much fun in the back of a car. She was the girl Harriet would have been if she were ten years younger and hadn't spent her adolescence in a sweater set and a maiden form bra. It would take her years to burn. For the young city girl who did the right thing, Harriet felt a dangerous sense of gratitude, as though Harriet owed her, as though one day the girl would come to collect, would materialize to reclaim Jude and see what a mess Harriet had made of the boy. It was not until last January, when the young doctor had offered her brisk diagnosis, that Harriet's image of Jude's birth mother had changed. Now she was a drunk, a 16-year-old drunk, a ghetto dweller, a street urchin with questionable hygiene and poorly fitting clothes and the same alcohol melted facial features as though they were a family trait. Or she was a prostitute. Or she was a junkie. It pained Harriet, the distaste she now felt for the mother of her own child. The only silver lining in this dim picture was that the girl, she was a woman now, of course, but she would always be a girl to Harriet, would be too drunk, too uncaring, or too dumb to look for Harriet, to look for Jude. And even if she did, 
this was perhaps an even greater relief, too incompetent to recognize Harriet's own incompetence. Still, she'd had an irrational fear that he would run into his birth mother in New York, the place of his birth, that one day he would see his own face looking back at him on the subway, or worse, that he'd seek her out. But he had come home to her instead, and he'd brought with him a pregnant 16-year-old girl. One morning while the boys were out and Prudence was at school, Prudence is Jude's younger sister, Harriet fed Eliza a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar to soothe the heartburn she'd woken up with. It sounds backward, but it works, she assured her. They stood at the butcher block kitchen counter, both of them in their pajamas. Eliza cringed as it went down, but after a few seconds, her face softened. It does, she said in wonder. When I was pregnant, I drank the stuff like water. Automatically, Harriet was careful not to say, when I was pregnant with prudence, to exclude Jude unnecessarily. They don't tell you about the heartburn, do they? Or the hemorrhoids, the varicose veins. Hemorrhoids? You still have those to look forward to. They should include those in the sex ed video, right? That would solve the teen pregnancy crisis. <laughs> Eliza's eyes closed and her hand went to her chest. She was either absorbing the molecules of her relief or fighting off tears. Harriet had meant her comment as a joke, but of course it hadn't been received as one. She put her hand to her own chest. Maybe she hadn't meant to joke. Maybe she was trying in her own sarcastic way to parent someone in this house. Jude had admitted before she could bring it up that he'd lied about going to school in New York. This she had suspected, and it was an affirmation to know that of all the dark and mercurial sentiments that commanded her parental life, the one she could still count on was distrust. She had known it was too good to be true. Strangely, Jude's disclosure of this fact made the rest of his conversion more plausible. So I probably should explain that Jude has undergone a pretty uh, dramatic transformation while he's lived with his father for a short time in New York. So um, after Teddy's death, he goes to live with his father in New York, and uh, his father's a drug dealer, so it's not exactly the best place for him to get clean. Um, but he starts to run around with Teddy's older brother, Johnny, who um, happens to be involved in the straight edge scene. Um, which means that uh, he quickly finds somebody who has a positive influence on him, and he, um, he gives up drugs, which his mother is feeling um, pleased about, but also a little bit dubious. Of course, he didn't plan on returning to school in Vermont either. He was working on his music. He was no good at school, he whined. Music he was good at. They'd started a band again, he and his friends. He was up early, he was eating breakfast, he was practicing with a diligence she had never known him capable of. This very moment, he and Johnny were downtown at a meeting with the chair of the rec center board trying to get her to let them use their space for their shows. Could she be blamed for enjoying the peace for a while, for letting his truancy go? The spring term was almost over anyway. He could go back and start fresh in the fall. But poor Eliza... Jude did what he pleased, and Eliza got heartburn. Christ, Harriet began, I'm sorry. She waited for several seconds for Eliza to begin to cry, and when she didn't, Harriet finally thought to put her arm around the girl anyway. Eliza accepted the hug more mightily than Harriet was prepared for. They stood on the tattered rug in the middle of the kitchen, Eliza's clammy forehead on Harriet's collarbone. She was small, smaller than Prudence, and even with a firm mound of her belly between them, she had the brittle bones of a child. I miss my mom, she said, almost inaudibly. This remark, combined with the inability to remember the last time she'd held her own daughter this way, who was she to think that Prudence wouldn't come home, knocked up, nearly brought Harriet to tears herself. Of course you do. Harriet cupped the back of the girl's head, giving it a little massage. She's supposed to be telling me this stuff. I know, honey. He's not even, she's not even looking for me. Gently, Harriet shifted the girl out of her arms. At first, she had worried distantly about the mother locating Eliza. Wasn't harboring a runaway a crime? In truth, she felt that Eliza's return to New York would be the inevitable and appropriate conclusion. She had not wanted this girl's water breaking in her home. But then Les had called late one night, shortly after the children's arrival, Harriet tripping downstairs to the phone. Sorry, he'd said, I'm on mountain time. Which mountain, Harriet had asked, half asleep. Eliza's mom is looking for her. I just thought you should know. The private investigator Di had hired to track down Les in Santa Fe, but Les had managed to pay the guy off, double what Di was paying him. Poor guy looks so pitiful taking the money, but he says his mother has medical bills. The PI agreed to throw Di off Eliza's trail to let her to tell her that Vermont came up empty, 
But Di wasn't stupid. I don't know what we've gotten ourselves into, Les had said. Jesus, I'd just do anything for that kid. It had taken Harriet a moment to realize that he meant Eliza. She didn't know where to begin. Les was the one who'd gotten them into this, and the protection he was now falling all over himself to offer someone else's daughter disgusted her. What protection had he offered Prudence in the last seven years? And yet when she'd hung up the phone, she'd done nothing. She hadn't called Diane to confess. She told herself she was staying neutral, allowing the stars to align themselves on their own. Your mom is looking for you, Harriet told Eliza now. Eliza closed her eyes. She is? Do you want me to maybe give her a call? Harriet asked. Eliza curled into Harriet's arms again, and Harriet felt her shake her head. No, Eliza whispered, and Harriet was surprised to feel a river of relief in her chest. Now, with Eliza's feverish head on her breast, she too felt the need to defend this cub from her own mama. It was the same proprietary impulse she exercised against the girl who'd given birth to Jude, to prove her maternal prowess, to make up for its derelict history. Diane Urbanski, the Jewish-British widow ballerina, was no longer merely a romantic rival. She was another woman who was coming to collect. Through May, as the fi first fists of bloodroot opened and the gauzy swans of Fiddlehead raised their necks, Harriet and Eliza turned the garden, shook the rugs, walked together to the farmer's market to buy eggs and honey and cheese. Out in the greenhouse, Eliza watched Harriet blow two salad bowls, a set of wine goblets, and a bud vase. Out in the greenhouse, Eliza posed for a drawing, a full-length portrait of her naked pregnant profile, which Harriet let her keep. Prudence spent more and more nights at her new friend Dina's house, leaving her room to Eliza. Had Prudence, the girl with whom Harriet had until recently shared a bed, shown jealousy or exasperation or the territoriality which Harriet herself had refined, Harriet would have known how to suffer this guilt. Instead, Harriet was the one who felt jealous of the mysterious people with whom Prue was now content to spend her time. There were new kids in Jude's life, too, boys showing up at the door with guitars, leaning their bikes against her house. Harriet let Eliza do her makeup. At the second-run theater, Harriet and Eliza saw Moonstruck. Meanwhile, the music stabbed through the ceiling of the basement. So Jude has started this band with, uh, with his friends, including Johnny, Teddy's older brother, um, and their straight-edge band, and they have their um, practice sessions in the basement. Harriet asked Eliza to translate the lyrics for her, but even she could make out only a handful of words. If Jude were to name his own children after the songs of his youth, they might be named truth, strength, or justice, purity, brotherhood, loyalty, trust. The words filled Harriet with a measure of gratification. Her son was singing the merits of purity, but they also amused her, embarrassed her, and concerned her. What kind of teenage boys sang songs about purity? What had happened to songs about getting stoned, getting laid? And if one had to sing songs about purity, she didn't mind songs about purity, why do they have to be so hard on the ears? They were awfully angry, these songs. The classics of her own youth about getting stoned and getting laid were strummed on the guitar. They were hummed in the shower. There were harmonicas. <laughs> Les had attempted to take up the harmonica one summer, but it was a phase. He had other passions to cater to. When Harriet had first met him when he was not much older than Jude was now, he had embraced drugs with the same unqualified exuberance with which their son now refused them. That, it turned out, had not been a phase. She hoped Jude's newfound sainthood was not a phase either. But how could it be anything else? His son's life story, her son's life story was a series of phases. Scooters, BMX, skateboards, metal, punk, hardcore, he had ADD, he grew out of a pair of shoes in six weeks, and the songs he now sang were an average of 45 seconds long. He would be over it by the end of the summer. Harriet watched the boys come and go, from the basement to the van, from Jude's room to the fridge. She listened for them on the stairs, on the fire escape, to the ring of the phone and the drone of their showers and the puerile wail of their guitars. She observed Jude's romance with straight edge as she might have observed his first love, warily, with a mother's pride, hoping that, in the end, his heart wouldn't break too hard. Thanks. I'm also really happy to be reading with such great writers. I um, love all your poems and love your books, so it's really a treat for me, too. So, um, And thank you all for being here. And 
yay spring rights. Um, I'm going to read from my new book, which just came out a few weeks ago. Um, it took a long time to write, and you can read it in about um, two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, it's written in a series of short chapters that um, I used to write for women's magazines. I still do sometimes. And um, when I was writing magazine stories, I, would, I used to write the how-to pieces, so like how to quit your job or how to make gossip work for you or all those stories. I wrote those. I mean, I wasn't the only one, but I did write a lot of those. And every time I wrote one of those, um, what was going on in the story, the opposite would happen in my life. Like once I was writing a story called how to, this is a real story, how to stay close to people you love. And I broke up with my boyfriend. I got in a fight with my mom and stopped talking to my sister. <laughs> so <laughs> this book is structured with, um, I actually use some of the headlines I used to write. And the book is structured so that every chapter has a how-to title and the opposite usually happens. Sometimes the same thing happens, but usually the, the, it's the book I wanted to write when I was writing all those stories. I wanted to tell the truth, and um, this is what happened. So here they are. The first one is called How to Unleash Your Inner Superwoman. This morning I was sitting on the couch reading a story to my son Liam when he interrupted me, looked at my chest, and said, Mom, do you use your boobs every day? He was like, I think he was three. Um, maybe two. I think he was two. I don't know how old he was. Um, I looked down at my breasts sitting in their underwire harness, not as much as I used to, I said to Liam. <laughs> Why do you have boobs, he said. And I told him that I, used to feed, that I used them to feed him and Dawson when they were babies. You ate all the time, I said. Do you use them to feed people now, Liam said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, and to clarify, I wasn't feeding just anyone with these. Do you have milk in them now? I don't think so. Let's see, Liam said. <laughs> I took a breast out and squeezed it. I know, but motherhood is an altered state. A tiny jet of colostrum shot out. Hey, Liam said, you have stuff in there. <laughs> That's right, I said. Mommy is very powerful. <laughs> OK, he said, put it away. <laughs> Which is the conversation we've been having about female power for centuries. Wow, look at that. You have stuff in there. Put it away. <laughs> it made me think of one of my favorite Anne Sexton poems, You, Dr. Martin. I've been reading a lot of Se Anne Sexton lately, in part because the short form is easy to read when you have small children, but also because I relate to her more now. Really, said my sister Maria, who often disagrees with me. She is three years older than I am, with high cheekbones and our mother's pretty heart-shaped face. We love each other fiercely, but either one of us at any time can start a three-day fight over something as simple as who left the fan on in the bathroom. And the tension we have from sisterhood alone is heightened lately because all she wants is to have a baby, and I have two, and all I want is my own apartment, and she has one. <laughs> I always had a hard time reading her in college, she went on. She's so depressing. Maybe, I said. I might have felt that way, too, back in my 20s when I didn't want to think anything was wrong. But now I just feel like she's real. It's the way she writes about motherhood and marriage fully, seeing all of it, not just what's good or what's bad. Never loving ourselves, hating even our shoes and our hats, we love each other, she writes in The Black Art. Or in my favorite, You, Dr. Martin, which she wrote when she was institutionalized for severe depression after having a baby. We are like magic, talking to itself, noisy and alone. I love that line so much. I keep thinking it's how motherhood often feels. We are magic, talking to itself, noisy and alone. We used to be something in our black sleeveless tops and tall shoes. Now we are standing in front of a pile of laundry, changing endless diapers, our essence dripping onto stained shirts, stuffed into hungry mouths. Now we are invisible, even in our best skirts, lost in a bowl, of a small boat of dishes, dried oatmeal, and a cat who needs his thyroid medicine. And sometimes I think motherhood is a particular kind of madness, one that is both irrational and tender, and this is where the soul of it lies. Why put it away? Why stifle this place which is vulnerable but fierce, loving yet ferocious? Why put it away when I feel crazy but I know I've probably never been more sane because I'm so tired I'm finally saying exactly what I mean? Why not just accept that this isn't about being good or bad? It's about trying to love the people you would give your own life for, even if they make you nuts. So everyone just take a few steps back or the stuffed rabbit goes out the window. <laughs> Once, I'm glad you're laughing because my husband was like, I don't get that. <laughs> How do you not get that? You, you're going to go out the window. <laughs> yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say it a lot. Um, there are no more stuffed rabbits in our house. Once I was beautiful, Sexton writes at the end of the piece, now I am myself, counting this row and that row of moccasins, waiting on the silent shelf. Once we were beautiful, now we are ourselves. I did, however, put my boobs away. Even if they do have power and feed people, it's not really convenient to have them hanging out all day. 
But just so you know, I said to Liam, mommies do have a lot of stuff. All women do. Oh, I know, he said. That's why I can't wait to be a girl. <laughs> so cute. Um, all right. So here's another one about my other son, Dawson, uh, who's very loud. It's called How to Silence Your Inner Critic. This morning I turned in my proposal for the novel I'd been working on based on a character from my first book, an oftentimes drunk advice columnist who never follows her own advice. So it's based on you, said my sister Maria. No, I said. I follow my own, vote, my own advice about 25% of the time. It's other people who never pay attention to it. Liam, oh my lord, what is that on the bottom of your pajama leg? Chocolate. Liam said, twisting around to see what I was talking about. I put it in my footies in case I get hungry in the middle of the night. <laughs> now see, I said to my sister, I would not advise that. And yet somehow it's not a bad idea, she said. Anyway, the proposal is done and today was unseasonably warm, so I got out the baby buggy my sister-in-law got us for Christmas and attached it to Tommy's old mountain bike. Tommy's my husband. I decided I'd get some exercise and ride Dawson around our town, which has two moderately steep hills. We hadn't gone more than 25 yards before Dawson started shouting. A few words about Dawson's voice. It is loud and high-pitched, like having a very demanding peacock in the back seat. Once we went to the science center, where there is a booth that registers noise level, Dawson went into it and started yelling, and his voice rated higher than a lion's roar. Warning, the machine said, flashing red lights and blinking. Constant exposure to this sound could cause hearing loss. <laughs> I knew it, I thought. Mommy, Dawson yelled. That's Daddy's bike, not yours. Dossie, this is Mommy and Daddy's bike. No, that's Daddy's bike. You should be very careful. I turned to go up a hill, which isn't easy hauling a 30-pound child. I was standing up off the seat, huffing and puffing, trying to get up the hill when I finally gave up and turned around. No, Dawson yelled. Town that way. Sorry, Dossie. I, I'm reading myself as if I was very calm. <laughs> And I'm going to continue to do that, but I'm not exactly sure that's how it went. <laughs> Sorry, Dossie, I said, we're going back home. No home, Dawson yelled. It must be hard for two-year-olds, I thought. They feel like they're finally getting to the point where they can tell us what they know, that avocados are intolerable as a snack food and walls are for drawing on, and we refuse to listen or we change things like bedtime on them. I completely understand. I often feel that way about work, like I've finally figured out some kind of solid narrative arc for a story, and then a character will do something like decide to cheat on his or her spouse or go to Hawaii instead of getting sober, and I feel like saying, no, plot that way. <laughs> no home, Dawson yelled again. Town. Sorry, honey, I said, you're too heavy. There was a brief silence. Mommy too heavy, Dawson said. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I said carefully. Mommy is so pretty. <laughs> Mommy's so heavy, Dawson said. So, that's how I spent the rest of my ride, biking a baby buggy up Main Street in Trumansburg with a two-year-old in the back shouting, Mommy's so tired! Mommy's so heavy! And me shouting back, No! Mommy's so pretty! Mommy's so pretty! <laughs> I think I'll just keep this baby weight for a while, I said later to my sister and my friend Isabel when I had put the baby buggy in the shed and the boy down for a nap. Anyway, I went on. I tried dieting a few days last week, and I gained three pounds. You know what that means, said my sister. It means you shouldn't diet. You could just buy some clothes that fit, Isabel said. Those seem like much more sensible solutions. That night I dreamt I took the kids to New York City and left them in Brooklyn by mistake. <laughs> okay. no. So this is one in honor of Mother's Day. Um, how to celebrate Mother's Day. Mother's Day began at one this morning with poor little Dawson, who was covered in chicken pox, waking up in tears. Oh, Dossie, I said, what hurts? Everything, he said miserably. It was as if his chicken pox were breeding and multiplying by the second. When he went to bed, his back was half covered. When he woke up, they had doubled. I spent the night spraying him down every two hours with an oatmeal colloidal solution he didn't like, but that seemed to help with the itching. His fussing, however, woke up Liam, who wanted help and then wanted breakfast at 2 a.m. and didn't go back to sleep until I don't even know when. This morning, poor Dawson looked like something out of the Book of Job. He has chicken pox on his bottom and his legs and his belly. He seems to feel all right, though. Liam and I went to the craft store and bought some clay figurines to paint, and we all spent the afternoon making little sculptures and painting them. We did this for several hours, and by the end of it, they were just rolling all over each other and climbing on me the way they usually do when Tommy came downstairs from working on job applications. Liam, I said, just stop climbing on me. Happy Mother's Day, Tommy said. Will you just take them out of here, I said. Tommy took the boys down the street for pizza. 
shouldn't Dossie stay in, I said, and he said, in this hippie town, there are probably people who would pay you to have Dawson roll on their kids right now so they can get vaccinated naturally. <laughs> when I read this last time, my friend Katie was like, I would. I was like, too late, too late. After they left, my mother called, thinking it was Tommy's and my anniversary. Is it today, I said? I pulled off my wedding band to check the engraving. No, no, it's on Tuesday. Oh, my God. My kids are driving me C-A-R-Z-Y. My mother burst out laughing. You realize you just spelled Carzy, she said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am Carzy, I said, and told her about the night before in my morning. I think something's <laughs> wrong with me. Why can't I just be present with the kids? I try to sit and build blocks. I try to finger paint, but after a few hours, it gets a little old. My mother was still laughing. Oh, honey, she said, that's the housewife's lament. It's hard to engage with your children all the time. You're in completely different phases. Before Betty Friedan came along, we were all supposed to sit around and just love being with our children, but then we realized that that's not always enough. I still think there's something wrong with me, I said. Nothing is wrong with you, she said. You have two very smart, demanding boys who are also wonderful. Then she said that Sunday in Quaker meeting she was thinking about the other night when we went to her house for dinner. It had been a stunningly beautiful night. The sky was a pearl gray with sun coming through some of the clouds, which just made the bright green grass, the red bud, and the early buttercups stand out like jewels. We were sitting at the table having just finished Mom's carrot ginger soup when Dawson crawled under the table and started kissing my mother's feet. What are you doing, she said, and he said, I'm kissing you. It was just so sweet, my mother said. No one has kissed my feet since I was a baby. It was the best Mother's Day present anyone could have given me. Later, I was thinking that I'm so grateful for the things my parents have done, the gentle, firm love my mother gives my children, the hours my father has spent with Liam down at the creek. I know that they're both getting old, and I think, what will I do when they're gone? I'll miss them so much. And then I see them, and we're all having dinner and doing things like dressing the salad or talking about work, and the kids are running around, and I never quite find a moment to say thank you or I love you so much. And there was Dawson, effortly doing what I meant to be doing but could never find quite the right moment, honoring the oldest woman in the room. After we finished dinner that night, Liam and Dawson ran out in their pajamas, or ran outside in their pajamas. The almost full moon was pale and bright, and the sky, still cloudy, made the night gray and dramatic. Tommy herded Dawson into the car, and I went down to the front of the lawn to find Liam and heard him making a high-pitched coo in the back of his throat. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I could see both my father and Liam silhouetted against the sky, my son up in the top of a black-limbed tree, hooting at the moon like an owl, my father quietly standing on the ground, making sure Liam didn't fall, while in the kitchen I could hear my mother talking to my sister as she turned on the radio. Thank you, I thought, but did not say. Thank you. I love you so much. So I'm saying it now. Thank you. I love you like crazy. Or Carzy. <laughs> um... I'll read one more, and then, uh, yeah, I'll read one more. Um, I'll read the next one. How to teach your child to ride a two-wheeler. This morning we were getting ready to go out when the children got into a fight over who was going to ride which bike to the coffee shop. They both wanted to ride bikes, they both wanted to ride Liam's bike, which, and they both wanted to ride Liam's bike, which had training wheels. Dawson's is more like a big wheel. I tried a technique I'd seen a friend of mine use, which is to pre prevent the children with their choices and try to let them work it out by themselves. Here is the situation, I said. Dawson, you want to ride Liam's bike. Liam, you don't want to share. Dawson, you don't want to ride your own bike. Mommy needs coffee. Is there a way we can work this out so everyone wins? <laughs> no, they wailed. <laughs> Liam, what if you shared, you shared and Dawson rode your bike on the way home? I don't feel like sharing. Dawson, what if Liam let you ride his bike later when he isn't using it? I am going to use it all minute of every day. Every minute of all day. I don't like you, said Dawson. <laughs> it looks like we can't go, I said. Is this the situation we want? Um, I didn't mention this, but I had had zero sleep for three days, I might add at this moment. It looks like we can't go, I said. Is this the situation we want? Crying began. Tempers rose. I tried more reasoning and cajoling. And then, I am not proud to admit, I got mad and threw both the bikes off the back porch and into the yard. <laughs> Liam started sobbing for real. Dawson thought it was funny and decided he would ride his own bike to the coffee shop. I tried to quell the mix of feelings, guilt, anger, and despair I often feel since I've had children. You broke my training wheel, Liam said, when his, sob his sobs beginning to slow down. I know, I said. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have lost my temper. But honey, those are the consequences when you don't share. Sometimes things get broken. <laughs> Liam wiped his nose on his sleeve and looked up at me. Actually, he said, things get broken when you throw them off the porch. <laughs> <laughs> it's like four at this point.
point. I mean, I'm in so much trouble with this child. He's so smart. We walked down to the coffee shop. I was hoping we could put this quickly behind us, but Liam went up to the first person he saw, who happened to be our friend Deva, and said, Hi, Deva. Dawson's being a jerk. <laughs> Mommy threw our bikes off the porch, said Dawson. Ah, said Deva, who has two boys around the same age as mine, one of those mornings. Yes, I said, you don't happen to have a bottle of scotch on you, do you? <laughs> Dawson told the barista, Emily, that I threw his bike off the porch. And I saw a monster under my bed, Dawson added. You did, said the barista. Wow, did your monster look like mommy? <laughs> <laughs> she has two kids of her own now, so that can come right back at her. <laughs> All I can say is that when everyone knows your business, you have a lot less to hide. When we got home, Tommy took what was left of the training wheels off the bike, and Liam hopped on his two-wheeler and learned to ride it in ten minutes. So, how to teach your kid to ride a two-wheeler, throw the bike off the porch, break the tra training wheels. I'm not saying I'm proud of it, I'm just saying it works. <laughs> a few days later, we were coming back from the farmer's market. Dawson was slowly riding his bike with training wheels, back completely erect, when Liam came speeding up behind him on his two-wheeler hunched over the handlebars. You need a bike like this, Dawson, he said over his shoulder as he sped by. You can go really fast. No, I don't, Dawson said, still pedaling slowly along, because I am only three. When I'm four, Mommy will get mad and throw my bike off the porch, and then, <laughs> and then I'll have a bike just like yours. <laughs> As it happens, on Dawson's fourth birthday, I backed over his bike in the driveway and accidentally broke his training wheels. <laughs> This comes with a little recipe. This is called Recipes for a Beautiful Life, and there actually are recipes in here. And the recipe that goes with this one is called Angry Mommy Tea, and it's chamomile tea, honey, and whiskey. And the, the thing that goes with it is, what? It's good for your throat. It is. You need to have the tea part. Uh, that's up to you, you know? Depends on the day. So that's it. Thank you very much.